Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming here. Uh, before we begin, uh, I would like to introduce uh, not only my CAFE advisory board members, can you please stand? And um, I would start this presentation by having both Matthew Wozniak and Avery Baruch come up and say a few word, uh, words to you. And uh, then we will have the dean speak, and then we'll get this party started. All right? Well, thank you so much. And thank you very much, board. Thanks, Doc. All right. Well, great to have everybody here. Really appreciate it. It means a lot to the program, you know, just seeing the friends, family, future student fund managers, and alumni kind of gathering here to see, like, a huge culmination of an entire semester's work. Um, I know the student fund managers did an exceptional job this entire semester. I was very fortunate that I got to travel with them to London, um, got to meet them, and I think, you know, we really value traveling, international traveling, I'll say, in the cafe. And that's because you get to experience different markets. You get to talk to different individuals from, you know, where financial markets are a lot different than the United States is. Um, one thing I will say, and personally I learned this on the trip, is that in the UK, they do not have fixed mortgage rates, which I did not know. That was a crazy concept to me, but it was something that I had no idea uh, was the case. Um, but again, you really value you know, the international travel. You get a lot of um, different perspectives, and you get a really great experience overall just getting traveled with a group of people like this. So I think that's one of the, I think the, the best parts about this program as well. I don't know if yeah, um, thank you all for being here. I know I'm personally really excited to be back. I'm coming up on my two-year uh, two mark since graduating, and it, it's unbelievable. Time flies. Um, so it's exciting to be back here and see what these guys have to present. CAFE is an incredible community, and bringing back students and alumni and um, parents you know for these presentations is incredible and the work they do is incredible and they spend so much time together in the semester so um, it'll be great to see what you guys have today so thank you all for being here Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Dia Das and I am the newest member here is what I understand because all of you have been part of this incredibly uh, fantastic program for many years now. And, uh, and so I am the one who's like kind of the new person in town and trying to understand what amazing uh, kind of an educational experience this is, right? Like, and, and in many ways, CAFE uh, embodies everything that is the best about this university because it is about experiential learning that we talk about. It's about you know, learning while doing. That is the best example of that is in CAFE. Uh, it's also about this kind of close community building that is across the years. So it's not just you know, about the people who are working here pretty much all the time, but also across the years when you guys come back and mentor and kind of help them and support them. Uh, and, and they learn so much from this relationship. So. Um, I can't tell you how proud I am of this whole program and how um, humbled I am to be able to take credit for it, right? So when I go out, I can talk about this and brag about it with zero contributions in many ways because this is now coming to, you know, 20 years and that's a really fantastic thing because, you know, a lot of times you hear about amazing programs, but an amazing program that is sustainable is, is a mark of not just, you know, uh, the faculty, but also all of you guys who come back and make sure that CAFE goes on for one more year. And, and, and in that spirit, it's going to be 20 years, and we know that we, there's a lot of amazing stuff that's planned for the next year, and I hope I will see you guys back here next year for multiple events here on campus and in many different parts of the country where we take the CAFE on the road. Um, and uh, But, you know, I, I want to first say that, you know, I, since I came here, I've never seen the cafe empty, so at every hour of the day, whether it's a weekend, early morning, late night, I've seen students in there, so I want to give a big round of applause to all these students because I know how much work they have to do and what it takes to stand here in front of all of you. But most importantly, I want to recognize and let's give a big round of applause for Doc for all the work. This is like the best thing that we can have in a university and you are you, you exemplify everything that is the best about this university. So I'm not going to talk much more. This is more about these guys, so I'm going to let them take over. But thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Dean. All right, Dean, take it away. 
Thank you so much, Dean Doss. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cameron Duvall, Managing Director of the Center for Advanced Financial Education. Assign me are the Associate Directors. Hi, everyone. I'm Raffaella Brunetti. Hello, I'm Judge Horvath. On behalf of Dr. Michael Mellon, the Founding Director, we would like to express a warm welcome to our esteemed alumni, family and friends, faculty, and even the future of CAFE in the back. Thank you guys for being here today. We're so excited to have you all here today to join CAFE's Fall 2023 Final Presentation. Today is just a glimpse into all of the hard work and dedication these student fund managers have put in this semester, alongside Doc's guidance and countless hours dedicated to the program. None of this would have been possible if it weren't for our alumni who paved the way before us. The dedicated support of our board members and the ongoing contributions and generous donations given to this program every single year. We honestly cannot thank you guys enough. With that being said, we would like to introduce to you our student fund managers. To my left is... Hi, I'm Jared Miller. I'm Matt Helbin. I'm Ramisa Wajid. I'm Ethan Boyvin. I'm Van Gatz. And I'm Dylan Chandler. And to my right is... I'm Alex Klitnick. I'm Gus Dodge. I'm Rob Joseph. I'm Philip Call. And I'm Kate Delaney. We'd also like to give a special thanks to Ellie Molina, a former student fund manager who is our conductor today. As many of you guys know, we manage two real dollar equity portfolios here in the cafe. Combined, they're worth a little over $450,000. With having two funds, we can focus on two different perspectives of investing, which truly highlights our versatility here in the cafe. Our first portfolio is the Cafe Growth Fund. This fund's objective is to see companies with strong growth potential in the short term through earnings, revenue, and market share. Our other portfolio is our Gabelli Value Fund. This fund's objective involves a longer time horizon where we look for companies that are currently undervalued. Our focus is geared more towards the company and what they do, rather than looking at just the stock itself. Cafe is truly an environment like no other, with how we run money on a daily basis, reflecting an atmosphere that of industry. No matter the job or industry these student fund managers plan on going into after college, the skills they have gained will allow them to be successful no matter where they go. Aside from Doc's foundational lectures, we as management like to hold additional meetings. We do this to further evaluate our portfolios, the economy, and any potential market movements. In doing so, the student fund managers learn to process the impact of news and various mechanisms currently driving the sectors, the industries within the sectors, and of course, our current holdings. With these tools, student fund managers are required to pitch buy, hold, and sell recommendations throughout the semester. As you will learn, this is an extremely detailed analysis necessary for our entire team to determine if this is the right action to perform. As for our written reports, student fund managers are required to write four daily reports, and it is necessary under our active management approach. To give you guys insight into why this is so important, we're the only fund in the United States where students can execute their own trades. Producing these reports allows us to be able to find buy and sell opportunities within the market at any point during the day. Now don't get us wrong, after reaching a consensus by the entirety of the group, each trade has to be approved by the three of us and Doc himself. Student fund managers are not only required to incorporate what they have learned in previous financial courses, but every single business discipline. It is necessary to have all the tools necessary to reconstruct the portfolio from scratch. Besides typical quantitative lessons, we also incorporate qualitative issues as well to better understand the psychology of investing. Therefore, in the cafe, Doc always stresses you must be both left and right brained. Let's first talk about our left brain analysts. <coughs> These analysts bring forth a logically planned math and science based perspective into the investment landscape within the cafe. They demonstrate their strengths within fundamental analysis, risk assessment, and financial modeling. Moving on to the quantitative side, we do address fundamental analysis, but we also like to address qualitative issues, such as behavioral analysis, chaos theory, and uncovering new opportunities. But we also like to address the right side of the brain within our student fund managers. We incorporate this approach into the cafe through our sector pairings. For example, Rob here is right-brained, while his sector partner, Philip, is left-brained. Together, they're able to share their different perspectives and collaborate with each other. After taking a look at the different characteristics between our left and right brain analysts, I know many of you in the crowd are probably thinking to yourselves, the left brain dominates within the cafe. No offense to you, Rob. However, we should also mention to you all how many tasks are given to us under an autonomous environment, where Doc just simply tells us, gang, let's make it happen. And I'm sure all the alumni in front of us can agree with that. When the student fund managers first walk into the cafe, they are prepared to take on the role of an analyst, a portfolio manager, a trader, and a team leader. As Doc loves to say, we wear a multitude of hats within the cafe. The first hat is that of an analyst, who is responsible for learning their sectors inside and out. Some of their roles consist of economic, fundamental, behavioral, and technical analysis. The next hat student fund managers wear within the cafe is that of a portfolio managers. Portfolio managers focus on our sector allocation, making sure that our portfolio aligns with our economic outlook. Next, they also assess risk on a daily basis, sifting through analyst reports, identifying any key threats towards our portfolio. And lastly, they calculate performance metrics to make sure that we're in line, if not outperforming our benchmarks. 
In the cafe, we also are a trader. Given our active management approach, we are able to execute trades at any given point during market hours. If you take a look at the screen behind me, here's just some of the trades we've made within the month of December and end of November. As we mentioned earlier, leadership is a foundational role within the cafe. Each week, we rotate between first and second chairs who take on additional responsibilities. These responsibilities are reporting directly to Doc, assigning tasks to the entire group, and also making sure that agendas are met under an efficient work environment. This rotation provides our student fund managers with an opportunity and a leadership position throughout the semester. The cafe is built on a foundation of adaptability. As the three of us were analysts this summer, we were able to invest in one market environment, and then moving in the fall, we had the opportunity to see how the economic environment changed for us. We truly experienced unique market conditions throughout our semester. In the beginning, we experienced heightened volatility due to the uncertainty and future movements of interest rates. Following that, economic data came out supporting the soft lending narrative from the Fed, driving consumer confidence, causing the V-shaped recovery you see towards the end of our semester. Through these various changes, we were able to adapt at a moment's notice, as our active management strategy has placed us in a position of success. Throughout the semester, we also were able to sift through economic data on a daily basis, ultimately evolving around our top-down analysis. Being able to swiftly navigate through these obstacles has not only prepared us for industry, but the real world. With that being said, we'd like to hand you off to Jared and Ramisa, who will take you in-depth on our approaches and as to why and how we incorporate them within the cafe. <coughs> Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned before, I'm Ramisa, and let us walk you through our portfolio management strategy in the cafe. In our world, understanding the economic environment is like deciphering the ultimate puzzle. But we do realize that some of you sitting here might not be interested in knowing about the U.S. economy at this moment, and of course, we do not want to lose you. So let's make this a little interesting. When taking a look at the overall economy, we have seen that the market has been volatile. And with that, we understand that we have an active manage approach, so we can alter sector weightings as seen fit within the economy. As analysts, we have taken a close look at the economic calendar provided to us by the Federal Reserve. We notice that this data provides a direct influence on the market going forward. So the consumer price index has been at the forefront of this discussion, being an, a leading economic indicator. Through that, we see that the contributing factors have been the federal government's issuance of stimulus checks throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. With that being said, the Federal Reserve has been implementing policy in order to curb inflation, attempting to bring it back to its 2% target. As most of us have heard of, the Fed is aiming for a soft landing in the economy and is utilizing its tool of interest rates in order to achieve that soft landing within the economy. Throughout our holding period, we have become vigilant of the Fed electing to hold rates higher for longer, which has eventually impacted our outlook and related sector rotation strategy. Aside from these measures, we've also taken a look at the large fluctuation within oil prices throughout our holding period. So if you look at the graph behind me, from mid-September until now, you can see a large downtrend forming in the oil prices. With that being said, their OPEC Plus has been implementing supply cuts in order to try to prop the price of oil. Lastly, looking at the unemployment throughout, our, throughout the year, we have seen that it has been rising, indicating a slowdown in the U.S. economy overall. When compiling all this information, it is critical to understand the notion that everything reverts back to the economy. Through then, we then target specific sectors and industries that we think are going to match that sentiment. And building off that, we understand that waiting drives all of our success, so coupling that with short and long-term catalysts to reinforce that. So one of the things that we focus on within our short-term outlook is closely analyzing upcoming quarters. So going into quarter four, we developed an optimistic view of the consumer discretionary sector, but we also kept in mind the cyclicality of this sector when determining our waiting scheme. So looking at historical data and patterns, we saw the apparel retail industry within the consumer discretionary sector performing really well during quarter four. As you can see on the chart behind me at the top left corner, we have illustrated the consumer discretionary sector's performance during the past three years. And as you can see, as we have highlighted there, the, how the consumer discretionary sector has been performing during those three years, especially during quarter four. Bringing this notion forward, our, our anticipation was further supported by Black Friday and Cyber Monday numbers we saw this year that increased to an all-time high. Anticipating good sales data for this year, we decided to overweight consumer discretionary in the short term within our growth portfolio. When looking at interest rate expectations, we saw how much they correlate with the real estate sector ETF. When looking at on the chart, you can see three circles highlighting each FOMC meeting. In the first two circles, you can see a drop in the real estate sector ETF as the interest rates were risen, so the sector ex interest rate expectations remained high. Although on October 31st, you see a run on the real estate sector in ETF as we saw the Fed pause on rates, indicating that there may be a rate cut as early as January 2024. Extending our outlook to a longer term, we also look at some of the global events that have a direct impact on the U.S. stock market and specific sectors and industries moving forward. 
specifically looking into the industrial sector, looking at the ongoing tensions in the Asia-Pacific region, specifically between China and Taiwan and Russia and Ukraine, we have seen that the U.S. has been ramping up its production in its military while it vows to protect Taiwan and Ukraine against any potential adversaries. Looking at that, we have spe and specifically the aerospace and defense industry, we decided to overweight the industrial sector within both our growth and value portfolios. Through the national debt crisis, we have also seen excess consumer spending. Through that, we have decided to underweight the financial sector as we see liquidity issues within the banking industry. However, we see ample opportunities for investment within the credit services industry as this industry does profit during periods of heightened consumer spending. Taking a look at the graph behind me, you can see our growth weighting scheme and which sectors we have overweight and underweight. As previously mentioned in our economic outlook, we do have the consumer discretionary as well as industrial sectors overweight, but we do think it's worthwhile to mention that we have the consumer staples sec sector overweight as well. So you may be asking why we chose to overweight both the consumer discretionary and consumer staples sector within our funds. For consumer discretionary, we noticed that with the sentiment regarding excess spending, we could capitalize on holiday and quarter four sentiment. And for the consumer staples sector, we simply overweighted this sector in order to hedge against any systematic risk that we see after quarter four. Shifting gears to a value perspective, we carry a moderately bearish outlook moving into 2024, and with that outlook, we decided to overweight sectors such as consumer staples, healthcare, and utilities. In our Gravelli Value Fund, we decided to underweight information technology, financials, and consumer discretionary, considering that they underperform in a moderately bearish market. So taking a closer look into our weighting scheme, you can see that we underweighted technology in both of our funds. But with that being said, we do have more weight within our growth fund in comparison to value. The main reason for this is we saw AI development drive short-term growth within the software industries, which we decided to target within our growth fund. On a longer-term scale, we have seen more political implica implications between the United States and China, so we decided to stray away from that. Going back into consumer discretionary, as you would have seen in the slides, in the previous slides, we decided to overweight consumer discretionary given our short-term outlook, and one of the short-term drivers to overweight consumer discretionary, as discussed earlier, was quarter four. However, as we move into, uh, into 2024 and we carry a moderately bearish outlook, we decided to underweight the consumer discretionary sector within our value fund, looking at some of the potential events coming up in 2024, considering the elections and the tax season that would eventually impact the quarter one earnings of some of the companies. When looking at the real estate sector within our funds, we're seeing that in the growth fund we do not hold any weight. As we're seeing in the short term, the Federal Reserve's uncertainty regarding interest rates has posed too much systematic risk for our fund within this time. However, as we shift to a longer outlook in the Gabelli Valley Fund, we actually do hold weight in the real estate sector, keying in specifically on the REIT specialty industry, as we're seeing tangible real estate increase in value as prices remain high. In the financial sector, you can see we're underweight in both funds. This is due to the banking industry, due to the basal changes in the framework, as well as we're seeing what we're targeting in the short term, exchanges, as well as credit services. While in the long term, we're targeting insurance and conglomerates due to the inelastic demand for their products and services. So now, what is growth? To us within the CAFE Growth Fund, we look for companies that are on strong upwards chart trends, overpacing, outpacing the overall market and their relative sector. So building off what Caden said, when we start thinking with a growth mindset, we tend to focus on catalysts for various sectors and industries that are going to drive the market today, tomorrow, and in the coming quarters. Within our growth fund, it's important to note that we invest in the stock, not the company. In contrast, with the Gabelli Value Fund, we switch our mindset to a long-term objective as we have an outlook to two to five years. We, the goal of this fund is to maximize our returns by minimizing our risk. We do this by finding companies that are undervalued based on their price fundamentals. In the Gabelli Value Fund, we target companies with low investor sentiment, but strong catalysts that are going to propel the stock price into the future with our buy and hold strategy. My colleagues will lead you through a few detailed examples later on in the presentation. Now, after understanding the difference between growth and value, we're going to take you through our three pillars of analysis. Now, starting off with our first pillar of analysis, when conducting a fundamental analysis for our growth fund, the first thing we look for are potential catalysts that could drive the company's stock price upwards. Then we look at their growth metrics and earnings in the coming quarters to see if it aligns with our overall growth objective. Within our growth fund, we tend to put a heavy emphasis on quarter over quarter increases in key metrics such as revenue, free cash flows, and cash from operations. We feel that these quarter over quarter metrics give us a better understanding of where the company may move in the short term. A headliner within our growth fund based on its fundamentals is Icon PLC. Icon PLC, as you can see from the three charts behind me, have perfect quarter over quarter metrics, as you can see with revenue, free cash flow, and cash from operations are all increasing at an increasing rate. 
When analyzing a company's price to earnings ratios, we do seek that that forward number is smaller than that trailing, leaving room for that growth in earnings or that G prime. If you take a look behind me, you will see that Icon has a G prime of 128%. Now looking at their coefficient of variation, the way that we calculate this is the company's standard deviation, so their risk, divided by their return, so their reward. And you can see Icon sits at 0.72, so they're taking on fewer units of risk per unit of reward. Now going to the last metric on the screen, current ratio. Current ratio measures if a company has enough current assets to cover its current liabilities. In the case of Icon PLC, you can see that they have a current ratio of 1.2, meaning they do have enough current assets to cover their, their current liabilities, which we deem favorable within our growth fund. Now Icon's core business is what is influencing these positive fundamentals. Their services encompass the entire drug development process from start to finish. And with the increasing trends in drug development lately, you can see this reflected in their stock price as they've already returned 7% within our holding period. Now switching gears to a value perspective, we favor different fundamentals of those of growth. As with a long-term objective, you have to look at different metrics. So in our fund specifics, we want to take you through the healthcare and the industrial sector. When looking at the healthcare, we wanted to target the healthcare plans industry, specifically United Health Group, as they have an inelastic demand for a lot of their products and services, as well as strong growth from its Optimum RX business segment. Looking at their one-year cash flow growth, you can see they have a cash flow growth of 17.29%, meaning they have consistent and strong growth that will propel them into the future, as well as a beta of 0.31, meaning they are taking on less risk than the overall market. None of these metrics mean anything to us unless we compare them to a competitor. So we decided to compare them to Elevance Health, another industry leader in the, in the same industry. And on the basis of these metrics, we see that, Elevance, that United Health Group is a better investment. Adding on to what Alex said, we can see that UNH has a dividend yield of 1.37% compared to their competitor, which has a dividend yield of 1.24%. The higher dividend yield signals to us that the company has greater confidence within their profits and their cash flows moving into the coming future. Then if you could direct your attention to the two charts on the right side of the board, this is cumulative average growth rate, in other words, CAGR. And how we calculate this is looking at historical data to create a growth rate to predict where the company is going in the future. Alex will walk you through the EPS and EBITDA charts. When looking at the EPS and EBITDA charts, we look at the past five historical years and then calculate it into the future. We make sure it's increasing at an increasing rate while being sustainable. Moving on to the next slide, we want to introduce you to the industrial sector where we're currently holding Packer Incorporated. Now you might be asking yourself, why are we not investing in the direct competitor Deer or the industry leader and sector leader Caterpillar? Well, at the time this company was pitched and bought into, the Packer was actually outperforming both Deer and Caterpillar, making it making it a good opportunity to buy in. EV to EBITDA in basic terms gauges a company's cash flows relative to their size. We can see that Packer's EV to EBITDA is 7.15, which shows that they have greater confidence than uh, Caterpillar and they're more financially stable than their competitor. Now when looking at their coefficient of variation, as I mentioned in the growth fund regarding Icon, you can see that Packer sits at 0.56, while the industry leader Caterpillar's is 1.76. This means that they are taking on fewer units of risk than their industry leader. When looking at total asset turnover ratio, this is how efficiently a company could use its total assets to generate sales. And on this basis, we see that Packer is a better investment in use, generating more sales for its total assets than Caterpillar. After evaluating our EBITDA EBITDA and our activity ratios, here in the cafe, we actually conduct a price multiple analysis to deem if a company is truly undervalued. In the chart in the top right here, you can see our analysis on price to cash flow. We weight price the cash flow the most heavily. Heavy, we weight price the cash flow the heaviest as cash is king. And based on this basis, cash flows cannot be manipulated by a company, and it shows the underlying productivity of a business able to generate cash from its underlying business. Now looking at the chart in the bottom right here, you see that we don't only do price to cash flow, we also do price to earnings, price to book, and price to sales. As Alex just mentioned, we heavily weighted the most at 40%, where everyone else is at 20%, meaning that we have a target price of $108.46, where Packer is currently trading at $97.63, giving us an upside potential of 12.10%. Now moving on to our second pillar of analysis, behavioral analysis. One key component of behavioral analysis is herd behavior. So when we're, um, sorry, when we see a mass of investors moving towards a stock, we like to perform our own analysis to see if it aligns with our growth objective. So we actually utilized this method when we bought into Decker's Outdoor. We saw de more demand for their Hoka as well as their UGG segments, which drove their re revenues quarter over quarter. And this was actually reflected when they beat their earnings estimates on October 27th and resulted in a massive price increase. And as we mentioned earlier, we are moderately bullish on the consumer discretionary sector moving into quarter four. And as we saw Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales surprised to the upside, 
So all of this affirmed our decision to invest in Deckers. So moving on to the healthcare sector, we have seen more volatility within this sector during our holding period. The main reason we believe for this is because Big Pharma has had its run when it came to the COVID-19 pandemic, leading to most of these companies becoming overvalued in that industry. With that being said, we decided to look for more stable industries within the healthcare sector. One of those more stable industries that we invested in was healthcare plants, as they've seen pretty steady demand throughout our holding period. And then one of our holdings within this industry is Molina Healthcare. This company stood out to us because of its recent target price increases by major firms, including JP Morgan, as you can see reflected on the chart behind me. Behavioral analysis has guided the reconstruction of our Gabelli Valley Fund, specifically within the communication services sector, as we are moderately bullish on the entertainment industry. We use these catalysts to avoid buying into value traps. We look for short-term and long-term catalysts that are going to drive the stock price up. So the catalysts that we saw in the summer and the fall have differentiated. In the summer, we saw that the market was being driven by the information technology as propelled gains were seen by the Magnificent Seven. However, shifting into the fall, we've seen that the market has become completely reliant on the Federal Reserve's stance on interest rates. A show of hands, how many of you in the audience have ever seen a Disney movie? Now, how many use Disney Plus? When we decided to hold Disney, a major reason was due to the familiarity bias of the company. Familiarity bias embodies investing in companies that a person has heard of, perhaps by using their products or services. With Disney being a household name, this is a catalyst within itself, making the company seem like an attractive investment. We also saw a value being generated as a result that integrating Hulu and their Disney Plus streaming platform, Disney Plus expecting to reach profitability in fiscal year 2024, their 7.5 billion dollar cost cutting plan and and the most recent announcement to bring back their dividend payment to shareholders starting in January following a nearly four year long drought. But the biggest reason why everyone, Disney's just magical. <laughs> 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 to illustrate the impact of behaviorals on Disney, you can clearly see the impact on the above chart. When looking at the above chart, we see the announcement of that 33% acquisition of, the of Hulu and we see that the stock price was driven up. As well as we see that cost cutting plan driving up the stock price again. All in all, we want to buy the company, not the stock. So next time, we want to highlight the industrial sector and the behaviorals we saw behind that. In the short term, we saw that the Israel and Hamas war was driving up General Dynamics stock. On October 8th, we saw that the declaration of war by Israel and Hamas, and we saw the stock price drop be dri being driven up. Well, on the long-term aspect, we see that the Ukraine war going nowhere anytime soon, as well as the Asia-Pacific tensions to continue to be a driver behind the stock. Again, we also see year over year defense spending to be increased with a 4.64 Kager. And General Dynamics is being very pivotal in landing contracts with its electric boat division, as well as an annual dividend increase for the past 29 years being a catalyst within itself for the company. Now if you look on the right hand side of your screen here, this is the six month chart for General Dynamics. You're also going to notice that there are two moving average trend lines. In brown is the short term 50 day moving average trend line, and in purple is the 200 day moving average trend line. And you're also going to see that the 50-day crosses the 200-day from beneath, which signals that this company is currently experiencing upward price momentum. Now, this is actually a segue into our third and final pillar of analysis, which is technical analysis. Technical analysis is something that isn't necessarily taught at other institutions, especially at the undergraduate level. But because here in CAFE we execute our own trades, we need to find bullish trade triggers as well as optimal buying points. And we do this through not only the utilization of chart patterns, but momentum indicators as well. So as Gus had just mentioned, we kind of split our technical analysis into two separate parts, both those chart patterns and those momentum indicators. When we look at those chart patterns, what we are actively seeking are patterns such as inverse head and shoulders, bull flags, and double bottoms. These all give us those bullish trade triggers and allow us to enter a position at the optimal point to maximize our profits. After performing both the fundamental and behavioral analysis of this company, we ultimately decided to buy it. We looked at different price charts over different time horizons in order to get a better understanding of the company from a technical standpoint. This, uh, this ultimately led us to our optimum buy-in date, which was on October 27, 2023. So if you take a look at the chart behind me, you will notice this is the most recent technical analysis we have performed on our company of Visa. So starting from the left, you will see that strong level of resistance around that $230 per share mark from the middle of May to the end of June. And you also notice come the end of June that there was a price breakout point through the level of resistance. And this level of resistance turned into the level of support, which was tested multiple times throughout the month of September. Come October 20th, we did see a major sell-off in the stock, which ultimately led to a negative price movement. Thankfully enough, this did rebound right away. And at the top of that rebound, this is where our sector analysts really started to closely monitor this, looking for that optimal buying point. 
And on our purchase date on October 27th, we saw a double bottom form on top of this level of support, which is an immediate trade trigger for us. So we instantly took a position within this company, and this has worked out in our favor as our current holding period yield is 13.54%. So here we have supplied you another example of how we perform technical analysis, but with a heavy emphasis on those momentum indicators. This is for one of our holdings of Intuit. It's a technology company within our growth fund. So like Dylan just mentioned, we look at three momentum indicators. The first one is RSI, which is Relative Strength Index. This measures the speed and magnitude of a stock price, while when trending below 30, this means the stock is currently oversold. Stochastics is the next momentum indicator that we look at. So this is an oscillator, meaning that there's two, moving, or two trend lines. And this also measures whether a stock is oversold or overbought. The last one is MACD, which is the moving average convergence divergence. So this is an oscillator just like stochastics, but this takes a short-term moving average line and a long-term moving average line to help depict whether a stock price is currently experiencing upward or downward price momentum. So if you take a look at the bottom of the chart, you'll see all three of those. What's important to take away here is that all three of them are trending downwards towards that oversold threshold. And especially when looking at stochastics and MACD, you will see that that short-term line is trending below that long-term line and after our buy-in date it did cross from below. Ultimately, this did make out to be a profitable investment. As mentioned previously, technical analysis plays a role in our individual stock selection and our buy and sell times. In value, we, we use technicals to ensure a company is at least 10% off of its 52-week high and to help aid in avoiding value traps, meaning avoiding buying into a company simply due to the fact that it dropped significantly in price recently. One company that we were really excited to introduce is Ulta Beauty. By a show of hands, who has recently bought an Ulta Beauty product in the recent months? I want to personally thank you for contributing to our holding period deal and making us a lot of money. I really appreciate it. Now going back into the presentation, at the same time period, you can see that there was two upwards trending trend lines, and as well as the drivers in 2022, it was the Black Friday pick of the year, as well as has positive earnings guidance going into the end of 2022. Moving down to the bottom right chart, we saw positive guidance moving into 2024, and this was due to the increase in beauty demand that we saw, along with our partnership in Target. After our buy-in date on October 2nd, we noticed a downtrend starting to form, but we stayed resilient within our prediction, expecting an increase after their release of their earnings. As we predicted on November 30th when they released their earnings report, the stock price jumped 10.81%, which contributed to our overall holding period yield of 20%. As many of you know, earnings season can be your very best friend or your very worst enemy. To navigate the volatile market during this time, we perform an earnings analysis prior to the announcement to determine, to determine any related news, changes in analyst estimates, and lastly, investor behavior leading up to the announcement. This allows us to take a proactive approach by implementing stop losses, altering company weight, or ultimately, selling a security as a whole. Over the semester's earnings season, our funds have had a whopping total of 56 hits and only 6 misses, with 40 securities having upward price movement and 22 decreasing over the following trading day. This speaks to the quality of our analyses of the companies we held in each of our funds. Our overall average change in price in that following trading day was a 1.44% gain per security. Within earnings season, there were hits, there were misses, and there were mistakes. In the case of Beckton Dickinson within our growth fund, we noticed declining price sentiment leading into the report. And to be honest with you, we submitted the earnings analysis too late. The market had closed, preventing us from putting a stop loss on the company. When the company had reported earnings in the pre-market the next day, they missed. And when the stock, the stock market had opened, this led to a, the stock had dropped just over 9%, prompting us to sell immediately. This led to a holding period loss of 7.6%. Now, if you look in the bottom left, you will see an example of one of, our, one of the front pages of our earnings analyses. These can be very descriptive and multiple pages in length. Here in the cafe, if a company's price reacts poorly to its earnings, we carefully sit down and analyze the earnings report to see what could have possibly gone wrong with the company. Google, being one of the comm services giant, saw a massive drop in its price right after the company reported its earnings, and we were actually on our way to the New York Stock Exchange the day Google reported its earnings. Being the sector analyst for Google, me and my sector pair sat down and carefully evaluated the company in all aspects and actually found potential within the company. So we decided to dollar cost average our position, which in, at the end it, uh, turned out to be a positive investment for us in both of our portfolios, as you can see on the screen behind me. When it comes to earnings season, future guidance means absolutely everything. A company can be all its estimates, yet if it lowers its future guidance, it can immediately fall out of investor favor. We use guidance as an indicator to determine what a company's future will likely look like and ultimately make decisions to buy, hold, or sell a company as a result. So in order to illustrate an example of this strong guidance, behind me you can see Salesforce, which is in our value fund. This company actually ended up shooting up 9% after beating its earnings as well as reaffirming its guidance for the coming quarters. 
The main driver for this was the integration of AI into their Slack platform. So this actually ended up increasing their revenues for the future quarters coming forward. While we think it's important to show you a strong example, it's also important to show you a weak example. So behind me, you can see Cisco, which is also in our value fund. This company ended up dropping 9% after weaker than expected guidance came out for the future. The main driver for that was the slowdown in new product orders for this company. With that being said, we ultimately decided to continue holding it based on its very strong fundamentals. Lululemon is a company that we purchased on the 29th of September, and this was due to high performance expectations as we were heading into quarter four. Now, we knew that this company was set to release quarter three earnings on the 7th of December, so my colleague Matt and I performed the adequate earnings report analysis. In our earnings analysis, we looked at historical data to make an educated decision on why we should sell the company. As you can see in the two charts up here, there is a 2021 chart and a 2022 chart. December 5th is really important because that's when we thought we should sell the company two days before their earnings report came out. We thought history would repeat itself. As you can see, on December 5th of 2021, you see immediate price drop, and then the same thing happened on December 5th of 2022. Now, on the 7th of December, Lululemon reported an earnings surprise of 10.72%, which led to a 5.37% stock price increase on the following trading day. Now, for the first time in three years, history did not repeat itself, and we ultimately missed out on capital gains. Although we did miss out on capital gains, we were able to take profit, as we did have a holding period yield of 20%. Moving on to our active management strategy, student fund managers are responsible for creating pitch decks for not only the management, but our fellow colleagues as well. To reiterate what the AG said earlier, we need to be prepared with a buy list in order to sweep a company at a moment's notice. Over the course of the semester, we performed 37 buys and 30 sells within our growth fund and 54 buys and 52 sells within our value fund. This level of heightened activity can be attributed to our extensive portfolio construction process requiring well over 100 value pitches in and of itself. Also, the constantly shifting economic environment, and lastly, the active management style of the CAFE program in and of itself. One key skill that the CAFE has instilled in us is adaptability. Looking at the economic environment when we inherited our funds, we had to adapt to a sink or swim approach. Given our thorough top-down analysis, we were able to analyze the economy first, target specific sectors and industries moving forward, and create a weighting scheme that eventually led to the success of our portfolios. This mindset allowed us to respond to evolving market conditions and adjust weights accordingly. You all heard in this presentation how we had to adapt to the Fed's constantly shifting stance on rate hikes and cuts. An actual example of how this affected our portfolio was initially at the start of the semester assigned to underweight the industrial sector with the expected rate hike in the near future. However, over the course of the semester, we witnessed conflicting economic indicators and the growing possibility of a sooner than expected rate cut. This in turn led us to add more weight back in the industrial sector as we foresaw positive price momentum in the near future. So based off of that active management strategy, something that we are constantly doing is monitoring our fund, but not only that, each individual holding. This helps us know when to collect profits or cut losses, and in this case, we collected profits on one of our top gators of Sunoco. So as you can see, Sunoco is up 15.74% within our holding period, and then we noticed some concerning factors. So they released new numbers and announced that they had a negative growth in earnings predictions, which as we mentioned in fundamentals, does not align with our growth approach. So alongside those negative growth in earnings predictions, there was also some other concerning factors with Sunoco, such as they were trading extremely close to their 52 week high, only a few percent off, with no, no real strong drivers behind it to push them through that level. On top of that, Sunoco is very heavily dependent on those oil prices, and with the prices being so volatile throughout the semester, especially to the downside, we felt that this was an opportune time to seek growth in another company. Then upon the sale of Sunoco, we immediately swept the company with Targa Resources. When we were evaluating these two companies, we felt that Targa had much more upside potential, with a growth in earnings predictions of 50.50%. This is due to the development of two new natural gas plants. With that being said, it's important to note that Targa has made us 0.25%, while if we continue to hold Sunoco, they would have lost 0.39% in that period. Overall, leading us to a total gain of 0.64%. On the other hand, we also have methodologies in place for cutting losses within our funds. A prime example of this was Hubble Incorporated within our value fund, where we saw that inflation was eating at the margins of companies within the electrical, equipment, and parts industry. This prompted us to sell with a holding period loss of 11.41%. 
Diving deeper into Hubble, the company did have very strong metrics across the board, but unfortunately was experiencing da daily price volatility, which was leading to downward movements in the price. This is something that we truly want to avoid in the cafe, and in order to mitigate that risk, we eventually decided to sweet Hubble with another company within the industrial sector in order to achieve the certainty we always strive for. So like Sunoco, we immediately swept this company and took a position within Packer. As you heard earlier, Packer has extremely favorable fundamentals, but also some strong drivers behind it. They're releasing a new truck model, as well as the starting the construction of a development center in Germany. So since our sweep on October 27th, Packer has returned us about close to 17%, while holding Hubble would have only returned us about 11%, and still a negative holding period yield of about negative 0.25%. So all in all, this change in investment did lead us to, to make capital gains with our value portfolio. Well, being an actively managed fund means that sometimes you have to walk away from an investment. Now, this can be due to maybe this company isn't matching your performance expectations, or maybe it's not aligning with your fund's objective. In the case of Amazon, you can see that we had an initial buy-in date on September 1st of 2023, and we decided to liquidate that position three weeks later due to our analysts seeing a lack of performance as it was down more than negative 5%. We then decided to buy in later on on October 2nd of 2023. Now, at the time, our analysts saw strong short-term drivers with this company as we were heading into quarter four. So on October 2nd, we took another position within this company, and we have returned a holding period yield of 8.5%. Going off that holding period yield of 8.5%, if we maintain that initial buy-in date, we only have a holding period yield of 6.5%, meaning that we saved an extra 2% holding period, holding period yield, excuse me, which contributed to our overall alpha in our value fund. To wrap up our growth fund performance and metrics, we want to show how proud we are of our growth fund performance and our raw return. We returned 6.69% outperforming the S&P 500 as well as taking on a really similar standard deviation. Going into our performance metrics, we're extremely happy to tell you that we have a 4% alpha in our growth fund. This can be contributed to our holding period yield, as you can see in the bottom right-hand graph, that we actually outperformed the S&P 500, Fidelity, Vanguard, American Funds, and Gamco itself. Taking a look at our trainer and sharp ratios, you can see that we are generating more excess return in comparison to the S&P 500 on a systematic as well as a total risk standpoint. When looking at our beta, we take on a 0.91 beta, which showing we're taking on less systematic risk than the overall market, as well as a CV of 0.29, or 0.58, excuse me, which shows on that we're taking on 0.5 units of risk per each unit of reward. So if you look at that table on the top right, you will see those weighted price to earnings ratios, ultimately leading to that growth in earnings or that G prime of 33.48%, which we are extremely proud of. Moving on to our value fund, although we are outperforming in Underperforming throughout our entire holding period, we want to show you after our, we rebuilt the value portfolio on October 12th how we performed, and we actually outperformed on this metric with an alpha of 1.06%. Taking a look at our trainer and sharp ratios, we did not generate as much excess return during our entire holding period, but we are happy to say that we did given our value fund reconstruction. Going into our market risk ratio, the beta of 0.71, it contributed to our overall alpha in that reconstruction date. And then going into the price earnings growth, also known as the PEG ratio, we had a 0.68 ratio, which means that our fund's companies were undervalued based upon their earnings growth. Although underperforming the S&P 500, we want to show that we're outperforming other value funds. If you look at the graph, was compared to Fidelity, Schwab, and Gabelli themselves, we outperformed them. So after a challenging and rewarding semester, the cafe has taught us life lessons that we will be thankful for for the rest of our lives, and I'm pretty sure our alumni sitting here can relate as well. By replicating industry and learning high value skills such as paying attention to detail, adaptability, and using industry software, the, ca the cafe has instilled in us the hardworking mentality that is needed to be successful in the highly competitive industry that lies ahead of us. Now, throughout the semester, we had an office hour schedule, but only for structural purposes. Us as student fund managers live by the phrase of not leaving until the job is done. And this increased efficiency while also replicating industry. And we were also very fortunate enough to go abroad and present both our value and growth portfolios to industry professionals at Gamco in London. Upon returning home, we brought in key valuable insights that we incorporated into our portfolio management strategy, and of course, made, made a lot of uh, memories that will stay with us for a lifetime. And then another great experience that the CAFE program provided us with was a trip to Gamco's headquarters in New York. Here we chatted with industry professionals about their merger arbitrage fund, as well as we're lucky enough to speak with Mario Gabelli himself. After this trip, we really had a new appreciation for how much Doc Makes the Cafe replicate industry. Additionally, we would like to express our gratitude to alumni Jacob Hallgren for inviting us to the New York Stock Exchange. 
This was an opportunity like no other, and it provided us with an industry-rich experience. Being the only school in the entire nation to be able to experience the closing bell on the floor itself is something really special and what we all are very thankful and grateful for. Bouncing off our invaluable experiences this semester, we are truly challenged on our ability to navigate through uncertainty, embrace change, and make informed decisions. Now before we end, if we could please ask all the CAFE alumni to please stand up for a round of applause. Thank you so much, guys. Now we would like to open the floor for any questions. <coughs> so someone asked me this question earlier about working in industry, but I would like to ask you about working in cafe. What was the most rewarding moment and perhaps the most difficult moment? Uh, I can start. I think the most rewarding moment was when we were doing our value reconstruction. Um, and we were learning how to pitch companies, and then when you finally got a company in the fund, it was like a real weight off your shoulders, so that felt really good. And then something frustrating um, would probably be the beginning part of it, when you would keep trying and try to find companies, and they would just keep getting rejected, so that was discouraging. Part of the learning <laughs> process. <laughs> Building off of Kate, it was incredibly rewarding to not only get companies in the fund, but also to see them perform well after a couple of weeks, and to see that your actions as an analyst actually paid off. Uh, to segue off of that, give me a few names that were shut down that you guys still really like to this day. I can start off. You want to go? Uh, Garmin was shut off. Um, <laughs> I, we all love this company, but Doc saw no growth, even though it hit earnings by 10% of their stock price. I'll also say that um, me and June pitched the company uh, URI, United Rentals, and this company saw our immense gains uh, in, the, in the following weeks that we pitched it, but it got shut down. <laughs> I mean, lastly, I mean, I'm a healthcare analyst, so I kind of took the brunt of the pain on the rejection. Yeah. So, I mean, Thermo Fisher, one of them, Bristol Meyer, to name a few. Just to start, Bristol Myers is not worth it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as a um, as a quick question, I see that in both funds, you guys have some international exposure. You guys didn't really touch on that too much during the presentation. Um, is there additional analysis that goes into these international companies? You know, can you talk a little bit, bit about the differences between um, analyzing these international companies versus some of the domestic ones? Sure, I can start off with that. So a major company in our Valley Fund that was international was Lind PLC, and so we were comparing them against uh, their competitor APD. So Lind is, was actually the industry leader, and not only do they have identical um, business models to APD in that extracting hydrogen, but that they also use the hydrogen for things like powering hydrogen trains and other vehicles within Europe. So we saw that as a major driver for the European markets. Another international company we hold is Chubb, as you probably are looking at right now. Uh, with the uh, financials being so volatile right now, we, we figured we'd branch out and give another, give another region a chance. And then, so, we were looking outside of the U.S. and financials. Chubb was the one that kind of just stuck out to our analysts the most. Yeah, just building off of that, too, it's within the insurance industry. And we were looking for more inflation and elastic industries, so we decided to target that one. Okay, thanks, guys. Given the Fed's dovish tone yesterday, how do you feel the funds are you know, relatively positioned going into next year? I think the street kind of thinks that we're going to get a lot more cuts next year than, uh, than the Fed does. So. Sure, I can take that one. So inflation still has not reached the Fed's potential target of 2%. They have stated for almost, what, two years now that they want to get inflation down to 2%. They will not stop their higher for longer policy or further rate cuts until this is achieved. So until this happens, we will not see the Fed uh, doing those cuts. And so our moderately bearish outlook still stands. Can you speak uh, a little bit to the cash position in both funds? I noticed, I think it was we're around seven and a half percent. I'm just curious what you're saving it for, if that's a strategic decision. Yeah, so we decided to hold a cash position in both funds, ultimately because of the fact that we have to make those intraday trades at a moment's notice and we can't go out on margin, so we need something there to rely on. But as you probably noticed that it is higher in growth, whereas growth usually sees, like outside of the reconstruction, our growth fund sees a lot more trade. So that's why it is slightly higher in growth, so we can make those positions. Thank you. And then in our value fund, we do hold the five, around the five percent cash position to limit volatility that we've seen in the market. As you guys have saw, it was a very volatile market through our holding period. So having that higher cash position gives us a little bit of a hedge on against that volatility. And we also did um, sell Lululemon, so this is going to be that we have yet to sweep, which we are holding a higher um, cash position than the growth fund. 
Thank you. So uh, I'm gonna look at uh, your growth fund here, FTAI uh, Industrials. It was your highest holding period yield in this sector, but the market cap is only 4.37%. How did you guys actually go about finding this and actually settling on that position? Sure, I can take that. So. Doc took a couple of students to an investor conference at the beginning of the semester, and the investor, con investor conference had a bunch of CEOs presenting their companies. One of them was FTAIs. So Doc came back and he asked me and Jared to pitch FTAI to the cafe. And so we found incredible drivers for them in the airplane repair industry, their engines. And so when we pitched it to Doc, he immediately saw their strength in the fundamentals and immediately put it in the company decided, despite their uh, low market value. Can you guys speak to a time where you took profits? Because we all know it's hard to sell when things are up, the FOMO, and easier to sell when they're falling. So if you guys have any examples of what you might have looked at to make the decision. Well, I mean, right now we're looking at Vertex. Uh, they yeah. had a, they're in a, I think the second phase of a trial for a non-addictive painkiller for diabetes nerve pain. So they're, I think their price went up 13% yesterday, and they're, they only dropped 2% today. So. As a healthcare analyst with Jared, we are considering that right now. Another company we took profits on was Novo Nordisk. We held in the growth fund at one point. As we do not see like the Ozempic craze lasting for very long, so we wanted to take our profits out and sweep up the more stable position in the long term. <laughs> you guys have a favorite nickname in here? Doc is um, Yeah, I would say, well, <coughs> It wasn't, it was just Gus at first, but then it changed to Mumbles. <laughs> <laughs> that was, and then we changed it to Stumbles after that. <laughs> <laughs> With, um, Jared, you guys inflation cooling off in almost every area except rent, how do you see this impacting VC profits and your value market? Yeah, I can take that. <laughs> so, when we were allocating into our real estate sector for value, we noticed that we had to be specific with the industry that we keyed in on, as I stated with our top-down analysis. So when we looked into REIT specialty, we noticed that Vissi Properties is, it's what it is is a spin-off of Caesars Palace, so they own a lot of real estate in a lot of different areas. So they own casinos, golf courses, amongst other things. So we noticed that with casinos and gambling being seen as an inelastic uh, catalyst, we were seeing that this posed us to a good position within our value fund in the real estate sector, especially. Is there a reason why you don't hold real estate? Or yeah. yeah, I uh, touched upon that in the presentation where we don't hold any position in growth as we see that in the short term, the real estate sector has been beaten up as we've seen um, uncertainties regarding the Federal Reserve's interest rate stance. But as I mentioned with our top-down analysis and value, Given our two to five year outlook, we keyed in on that specific industry and then we found that company within it that we thought was going to prosper despite the uncertainty. Can I follow up to that? Sure. Uh, yeah, we actually added weight into discretionary, consumer discretionary, as I stated also with the idea of holiday and quarter four sentiment in our growth fund in the short term. Yeah, so we decided to overweight staples just as a hedge simply against the systematic risk after quarter four because we weighted the consumer discretionary sector so heavily, so just wanted a bit of a hedge there. Uh, to what extent did you guys use like financial models and then do you have any examples of like making buy and sell decisions using those models if you use them at all? Well, to start off with, we have the fact sheets and then we also uh, Rob actually made this for us. He used the price multiples. He made an Excel sheet to, to show us if they were under or overvalued based on those multiples. Those are the two, I would say, main object things we use for our pitches. Guys, uh, great job. Was there a contrarian amongst the group or multiple contrarians? I feel like we all kind of um, build upon, upon each other and just kind of argue back and forth. There's not really... No one's, everyone's kind of having their own opinion. So there is a lot of arguing back and forth, but ultimately ultimately we do have to reach a consensus together. So that's usually the end result. Building off of that, we're seeing that 
we'd rather it's I would use a different term as well um, we're giving each other constructive criticism within our group we don't want to all agree with each other because then we get that confirmation bias so we think that seeing a different viewpoints and different perspectives that's important within our group and investing in general I just want to say a great presentation. Um, also, love their text. Want to see um, how are your 4 a.m. reports this, this year? Because I know that those are a point of contention uh, with many other um, classes. So I just want to know how that went for you guys. Yeah, I can take that one. The 4 a.m. reports were definitely a struggle at first, but over time, it definitely got easier, and we learned a lot by looking at like the international indices and everything. Yeah, and also we started off them taking two hours, and after we figured out how to do it in like 40 minutes, they were a lot better. Yeah, and we also have a very big group too, so it, we're splitting up among all of us, so it's not that bad. Was chat GBT used at all? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little. That helped it get it down to 40 minutes. <laughs> Most definitely. We don't know what chat GBT is. Did the outbreak of war in the Middle East affect your investment strategy at all? Did you have to sell anything to mitigate that risk? Yeah, I think the largest thing that, that impacted was the industrials with us taking more positions within aerospace and defense. But we didn't want to only rely on that aerospace and defense, so we also, in both funds, we have that aerospace and defense heavy in industrials, but we also have another holding to hedge, like in our value fund, like we took a position in Packer because we wanted to have sustainability behind it to hedge against it. Just to add on to that too, oh, come in. Um, just with the healthcare sector, it's huge over there as well. Um, spe specifically with pharmaceutical companies, so we tried to stay away from that. And then also the energy sector as well. We tried to find companies that were not as correlated with oil prices, so we moved into the oil and gas midstream more. I think Target is in that as well, so that's one of the reasons that Sunoco's uh, price and earnings were so messed up. For the weighted average price targets that you guys calculate, what's the time horizon for like the realization of to getting to that? Um, Price target is it like 12 months? Is it 24 months? I was just curious about that. So like the historical, like, can you elaborate more? So like the historical data is like five years. Right. I think so. The um, I forget what, what slide it was on. It was on the uh, oh so yeah, 12 month target price. 12 yeah. Per. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when looking at your turnover ratios, I think you touched on it a bit in the presentation. But can you uh, talk to me about what you saw in value that required you to turn over so much more than growth, which is typically more passive? passive? Sure. So during the summer, there was a disconnect in the economic outlook. The Fed's higher for longer policy officially didn't start until around June or July. So when the summer group had the portfolios, all the companies that were in the value fund were positioned for that outlook. However, since the economy has cooled down a bit, all the companies that were inherited to us in the fall, suddenly started performing very poorly. So as a result, we had to completely reconstruct our entire value portfolio in order to get one, get a new one that more resembly, more res, more resembled to uh, perform in that new environment. Well, the growth portfolio was better set up by the summer group. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I noticed you guys mentioned software when you're talking about AI as a winner, um, and I just want to ask if you see any other winners technology and kind of the AI race, the industries and the I'm sorry, could you, should we reset the question yes. again? You mentioned software as sort of a winner in, in the whole AI space as AI is growing. Do you see any other industries that might perform well? I think one of the biggest ones is uh, semiconductor, specifically with Broadcom. Broadcom has, has new AI chips that helps save on power consumption and also um, just overall CPU processing power. So because of that, they went up 9%, I believe, a couple days ago. So it's been working out for them. All right, one last question for you guys. Um, so coming into CAFE, I'm sure none of you were financial analysts before. Um, how has CAFE impacted your career outlook or maybe changed your minds about working in finance? Uh, I'll go first. Uh, to be completely honest, before I came into CAFE, I had no interest in the analyst role. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted to, I was 100% set on the sales role. But now that I've had like the hands-on experience and understand what I'm doing, I feel like I'm leaning a lot more towards that role. So I mean, I, I can speak for myself that I think it's like actually changed my mind in a good way. Yeah, I was actually one of the people that went to the CAFE program this semester that didn't take 325 with Doc. 
So I kind of went into the semester not, not knowing as much and trying to do as much as I can to kind of catch up. And I didn't really have an idea of kind of what that financial analyst mindset and career outlook was. But being in the cafe, it's kind of opened my, opened my kind of network of kind of looking, to, looking towards the industry as well by broadening my knowledge about it. And I've kind of found it a lot more interesting, interesting than I originally thought it would be. I definitely think the cafe helped me a lot with presentation skills and just simply present, presenting in front of a lot of people. I mean, I've never done something like this before. <laughs> it's honestly crazy that I did okay. <laughs> so, did great. Yeah. I would also say that, you know, I was always worried about, you know, working a nine to five, you know, those are excruciating hours. But, I mean, here in the cafe, I mean, it's literally 24-7. <laughs> <laughs> I can bang out eight I'll hours. Take it back so it's like, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you guys. <laughs>